visitors. I want to welcome those who are streaming live with us today from Facebook and from YouTube. We just say welcome, welcome to our Valley Family Church today. It is so good to see you all today. We are so glad that you all decided to worship with us today. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, we thank you that this is the day that you made. God and God, we've chosen to rejoice in this day. Father, we thank you, Lord God, as your word says, if you be lifted up from the earth, that you would draw all men unto you. And Father, this morning, as you drew us into this place, God, we came to lift you up. We came to glorify you. We thank you, God, that there is none like you, none beside you. Father, we thank you for the anointing in this house, the anointing that's going to destroy every yoke, the anointing that's going to remove every burden right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord God, as we use the keys of the kingdom of heaven today, Lord God. We're finding the spirit of infirmity right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for healing today, Lord God. Father, we're believing, Lord God, for signs, wonders, and miracles, Lord God, happening in this house today, Lord God. And Father, we're going to give you praise today, Lord God. We're going to worship you today, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now what I want you to do, I want you to look to your left, look to your right, and greet your neighbor and tell your neighbor that you are so glad that they're in the house of the Lord this morning.
forevermore father they're in your hand they're not in the world's hands right now we just pause for just a moment to rest in your presence holy 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 is the lord god almighty can we say that across this place holy 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 is the lord god almighty father we exalt your name and we thank you for the, for your presence that has come among us right now 
Father, we love you. Receive our worship. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated this morning. We want to welcome you to Valley Church today. And we want to give a special welcome to any first-time guests in the house today. If you're a first-time guest, if you wouldn't mind, grab a Connect card from the seat back in front of you. Fill it out and place it in the offering plate as it will come by in just a moment. We would love to connect with you today. Now, as we transition from our time of worship to our time of offering, I would love to share a scripture with you. In Psalm 96, 8, it says this. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. You know, it takes an offering to come into the courts of God. Think about that time when you woke up and life had just been pressing down on you. It could be days, it could be months, it could be years, but life was pressing down on you. And you didn't know how to muster the energy to get into the presence of God. You didn't know how to cry out anymore. You had no energy left. But somehow, you found the energy, the offering, and you gave it. And then you made it in to the courts of God. Ushers, if you'll come. You know, I would give anything every time to get into the presence of God. So God, you're telling me that if I give my money, if I give my resources as an offering, you'll let me in to your courts? Well, if that's the case, then I'll give you my tithe. I'll give you my offering. I'll give you my entire bank account because one thing is for sure. I have to be in the presence of God. There's no other place for me. So let me ask you a question today. What would you offer to get in to the courts of God? Would you offer your time? Would you offer your finances? Would you offer your energy? Would you offer your sin? It always takes an offering to get into the courts of God. And with that, if you would, place your offering in your right hand. Let's raise it to the Lord. Father, right now, I pray that you receive this offering. I pray, Father, that all across this room, everyone that can hear my voice, I pray, Father, that we can enter into your courts with the offering. Father, press this offering down, shake it together, let it run over for your kingdom and for your glory, and we will never fail to give you glory, honor, and praise. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Valley Church. I cannot believe it is the last Sunday in August. So buckle up. Here's a few things coming up that you need to know about. So this week, we kicked off our Connect Groups. We sure did, and one of them made me this incredible superhero cape. No, they didn't, Trey. That's a blanket. A what? A blanket for the nursery. Oh, that makes more sense. One of our Connect Groups actually made those blankets for our nursery. It's a crafting group with Shanine Walker. So make sure that you go to the app and check out all of our Connect Groups that we have this fall. On Friday, September 1st, the Valley Middle is meeting here at the church for their night out on the town. This is a lock-in event. It costs $40, and it is due on September the 1st. So make sure you sign up in the lobby today. Hey, Trey, guess what next weekend is? What? It's our Labor Day block party. It sure is. Immediately following our second service, we are going to meet in the field next door for a great time. We're going to have inflatables. We're going to have games, a DJ. We're going to have food trucks. You will have to bring extra money for that. We're also going to have a fire truck. So make sure the little ones bring their swimsuits, their trunks, and also sunscreen. It is going to be so much fun. Don't forget your lawn chair and a blanket. Hey, Jody. Did you know that our Thrive Ministry was going to the Waffle House? I told you last week, it's not Walmart, it's not the Waffle House, it is the Walford House. So our Thrive Ministry is going to be going to a matinee dinner theater. They are so excited for this. We've got signups in the lobby. 
You've got to sign up by September the 6th. There is $70, a $70 fee that is due for that, so make sure that you sign up and get that paid for. Our young adults are meeting September the 8th at 6 p.m. for their next night out on the town. We don't know exactly where we're going yet. More information is soon to come. Make sure that you sign up for this in the lobby. Calling all of our ladies, our women's ministry is getting together for their first Fridays on Friday night, September the 8th, right here at Valley at 7 p.m. They're gonna have a very special guest speaker that you don't wanna miss, Alexis White. So ladies, make plans to bring out your girlfriends for a fun night together here at Valley. Coming up on September the 15th, Valley Kids is hosting our Girls Slumber Party. We begin at 7 p.m. and it goes all the way to the next morning at 8 a.m. This is an incredible time for your girls to have a lot of fun, get to pamper themselves. They don't want to miss it. You can sign up today on the Valley Church app. Our marriage conference is quickly approaching. Mark your calendars for September 29th and 30th. Make sure that you go onto the Valley Church app today to get signed up. This year's Field of Treats is coming up soon on October the 28th, and we need your help to make it a success. You can do this by donating individually wrapped pieces of candy at Valley Kids Check-In and by signing up in the app today to decorate a table to hand out candy. This is going to be an incredible event, but we need your help. Sign up in the app today. So now that you know everything that you need to know, it is our pleasure to bring to the stage Pastor Jason Cook. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, somebody. I, uh, I want a couple of, do a couple quick follow-ups with what they talked about, things that are that important coming up. Labor Day weekend, that Sunday, we're having a block party right here in the field to your left, to my right, to your left. We have uh, a lot of food trucks coming. The fire department's coming. We've asked them to bring a, a fire truck that's not on call so they can empty the, con the content of the water tank onto our kids. A we got a big, a big foam pit that's coming that, that Trey has been working on. We're going to spend a day after this service doing nothing but hanging out. When was the last time you, you had no agenda other than just get to the field? This is what we're having. And just, we just want everyone to come and have just a great time with us. And, and we'll play cornhole a lot of trash talking, there'll be basketball, different things like that. And, and anything else my health insurance won't cover. Um, coming up at the end of September, on September 29th and 30th, we're having a marriage conference. The theme of the marriage conference is I Still Do. This is for all married couples, for singles that want to be married, and for marriage who want to be single. This is for you, okay? Uh, Everybody needs a vitamin B shot in their marriage. We have uh, Stan and Teresa Holder will be our guests for that. They are incredible. They are the administrative bishops at for Delmarva, D.C. Uh, Stan Holder is, is an incredible leader in the Church of God. His wife is a retired teacher, and she is a pistol. I was going to say that. I, when we saw them on stage together. Uh, Jarrett and I both looked at other and said, we got to get them. So we waited in line after the conference, and I said, i got to have you guys. When's good? And the best place we could get the, our schedules matched up was at the end of September. I would encourage everyone to be part of that. Um, if you have friends that you work with, maybe go to school with them, maybe you, you live in their neighborhood, and you know it'd be healthy for them to be in a marriage conference, we want you to invite them. Okay? Good stuff. The surveys are in for our three service model. We gave you a survey the last couple weeks about what service you'd like to attend. Here's how the breakdown goes. 14% of us said we'd come at eight o'clock. 20% of us said we'd come at 11.30 and 66 said they would come at 9.45. Do you see my issue? If you don't know anything about what we're doing on September 17th, we're going to a three service model. Now, you probably didn't, don't know this, but we're, we still have some room in here. We just don't have room up there. Our first service, I think, was we had more in here in the, first, in the 9 o'clock service. So what everybody says, well, I'm going to do the 9, I'm going to do the 945. Most everybody, most everybody in here said that. But the reality is most of you guys rolled up in here about 1115, 1120. 
Come on, Corey, help me. Um, our 9.45, 11.30 service will be identical, just as they are now. Our 9 o'clock and our 11 o'clock service, are, are, they're identical. Our 8 o'clock service will be a little bit different. Uh, we're going to throw the music back in time a little bit. There's not going to be a children's church, but there will be a, a, a nursery. And uh, somebody says, well, what, kind of, what kind of music, Pastor, are you thinking about? You know, and, and my brother called the other day. He goes, Jason, you know what you need to do? You just need to let people know what kind of music you're going to be playing. I said, well, how do you do that? He said, you just sing a song. So I thought I'd sing a song for you today. This goes way back, back when people used to talk about the rapture. When, when God was going to come back and take his bride away and, and they were going to go to heaven. And, and this one song talks about the robes that the, the saints had on when they dipped him in the blood of the lamb. Well, it goes like this. You guys ready? I'm going to be in the key of F, E minor, and I'll jump up to But it goes like this. In my robe of white, I will fly away to that land so fair. Meet my Jesus there. It will be so grand when I get to that land. In my robe of white, I will fly away. Well, first I'll hear the trumpet sound, and all the saints will be heaven bound. We'll walk over Jordan wide, stop in view the other side. I'll see those holy hills and my mansion he has built. I'll be the first one in line to see my name in the book of life. Oh, in my robe of white, I will fly away to that land. So fair, meet my Jesus there. It will be so grand when I get to that land in my robe of white. just going to throw some stuff back, but it's going to be some good times. And, and I want to encourage everybody that is an empty nester, that you're not, you're not trying to get other bodies up in your house, eight o'clock's early. But the great thing about, you know, the old saying, the early bird gets the worm or, or early birds, no, late birds have no worms. Right. But I want to encourage you to, 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 to reshuffle some things. I know everybody's not going to move away from 945, but if I get some to come to 8 and I get some to come to 1130, it balances things out for us and does exactly what we want. We're going to double up our parking lot space. We're going to double up a seating space in here, and we're certainly going to help our kids ministry a little bit, spread some things out. We're projected to be in this building by early November. So that's kind of, that's kind of our goal and our hope. And when we cut, when we cut that ribbon, it's going to be like, the, 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 uh, when they opened up Solomon's temple, you know, the, the one he built. So is everybody doing okay? Guys, thank you. Y'all did good. You guys can go if you want. Corey, you're going to stay with me till the end. Did the band do a great job today? It took on a little country flavor. I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying with that country flavor. We didn't practice, so they did pretty good. So I did it in first service, acapella. Acapella, acapella, all the Barney Five fans. Hey, this is week number three of a series entitled, I Serve. This will be our last sermon in this series, but we've been trying to encourage everybody to get involved, to serve. And today I wanna to talk to you about a simple concept of just do it, faith, just do it. We need to be doers of faith, not just sayers of faith. So I'm going to open with a story about squirrels. There's a small town that had a, just, they were just invaded with squirrels. And the squirrels all came around all the churches and the church leaders were trying to get rid of the squirrels. And so here's how the story goes. The Presbyterian church called a meeting to decide what to do with the squirrel infestation. After much prayer and consideration, they concluded that the squirrels were predestined to be there and they could not interfere with God's divine order or will. So they left the squirrels alone. Where the Baptists down the street, 
the squirrels had invaded their baptistry. And the deacons met and decided to put a water slide in for the baptistry, hoping that the, that the squirrels would slide down the baptistry and drown themselves in the baptistry. What they didn't feel, what they failed to realize is that squirrels could swim. And the squirrels really enjoyed the slide and more squirrels came to enjoy the baptistry. The Lutheran church down the street decided that they were, they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures. So they humanely trapped the squirrels and set them loose down the street at the Baptist church because they loved the slide at the baptistry. The Episcopalians tried a much more unique approach. They set little bales of whiskey out trying to get the squirrels to drink the whiskey and they would die of alcohol poison. And what they did not realize is that drunk squirrels can tear up a lot of stuff. The Catholic church came up with a more creative strategy. They baptized all the squirrels and made them members of the church. Now they only see the squirrels at Christmas and Easter. Not much was said about the Jewish synagogue in town because after they after they circumcised the first squirrel, they never saw another one. That joke has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. I thought it was funny though. God is good. And so today we're gonna to talk about faith and serving. And my message is just do it. Faith, just do it. Sometimes we just talk about faith. Sometimes we try to share our faith, but most of us are never walking out our faith, never demonstrating our faith. And so today, I want to encourage you about faith. When, in 1999, there was a movie that came out called The Sixth Sense. And a little boy made this famous, his quote, he says, I see dead people. And it's one of those movies that you watch and at the end of it, you're like, what? How did I miss all that? Then you got to watch it a second time and you start catching things, but then you don't catch everything. And by the third time you watch it, you're like, dude, the director was brilliant, just flat brilliant, because there was so much in here. What happens in the movie, here's a spoiler alert, if you didn't see it, most of you guys are probably not born at that time, but I think I was five. I'm kidding, six maybe. But this little, the, the movie starts with this little boy sitting at a table with his mom and dad. And the mom is just really distant with dad. And dad and the boy talk all the time. And, and you, just, you can just see how mom is sad. And, and she never talks to dad, but dad's always there. He's always at the meetings. He's always at home. And, and the little boy kept telling his dad, I see, I see dead people. And then in the movie, he would start seeing dead people. He would, he would help them. And at the end of the movie, you realize that Bruce Willis was his father. But the whole time the movie was portrayed, Bruce Willis was dead. But you never picked up on it because he was in all the scenes. But when you watch it, the wife never acknowledged him because he wasn't there. She never saw him, but the little boy saw him all the time. That's why he said, Mama, I, I, you don't see it, but I, I see dead people. And I want to tell you today, when it comes to the church and serving, I want to tell you that I see dead people. You're here, but you're not here. Is that too hard? As a pastor, sometimes a pastor has to wear many hats, okay? Sometimes I wear the hat of a coach. And I'm always, that a boy, that a girl. One more time, let's take one more lap. Let's do that again. Great job, great job. And sometimes I've got to take on the role of a disciplinarian. How many times have I told you? And sometimes I'm a gardener. Sometimes I'm a firefighter. Sometimes I'm a police officer. Sometimes I'm a teacher. My job today is to op open up the word of God to you. To make sure that your faith can stand trial. Most of, if, most of us, if our faith went on trial, we would not be found guilty of being a believer. Let that sink in. I'm a believer about things I say. Well, that's not what constitutes a believer. It's not about what you say. It's what you do. So could your faith be found guilty today of being a believer? At the end of this message, I want it to be. 
So can I challenge you today? In my robe, just kidding. Can I challenge you today? Guys, come on, wake up. Everybody, everybody stand up, everybody stand up, come on. And I could be a cheerleader too. I want everyone in here to open up your eyes, open up, open up your ears, open up your, your mind, open up your heart. All right, we've got to spend the next 30 minutes together, okay? Since we've got to do that, why don't we just glean something from the Word of God? Would that be fair? You may not like my jacket, you may not like my shirt, you may not like my hair, but I want you to love the Word of God, okay? So I'm going to open up with three scriptures, three different places in scripture. I'm going to show you where one writer says, faith without works is dead. I see dead people. We're going to read another one where Jesus says, if you do what I tell you, my Father's going to reward you. Bam. I'm going to show it to you. What I want you to do is take the Word of God for yourself, run it through your meat grinder, and whatever sauce comes out of that, you got to own it. Okay? Everybody say, love Pastor Jason. It's going to be tough today. It's going to be hard today. But love will prevail. Are we ready? I'm going to start in James chapter 2. I'm going to jump to John chapter 12. And I'll finish in Proverbs chapter 11. This is just the opening. So as I get the can opener ready, you guys get ready. James chapter 2 verse 14. James is speaking to us. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So, also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Faith by itself, with no works, James says, you're dead, or your faith is dead. In John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus said this, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. If anyone serves me, he said, there's a reward. My father's going to honor you. Where we miss the boat is we think man's going to honor us for doing God's work. That's not what it says. It says that God will honor you. That's a much better honor than man honors. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, it says, Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Sometimes we think when we, we give and we do that, that everything's going to come out of us and we're going to be drained and like, almost like a dehumidifier is going to suck all the water out of us. But he said, no. He said, if, if you pour out, I'll pour out on you. If you water, I'll water you. That's pretty good. So today, my job is to cheer, cheer, rah, rah, Let's go, let's move. But I want to get into your deep processes of the cog your cognitive mind. I want you to think today. I know the Pentecostal church gets a lot of flack for being emotional. We're emotional. But I also want to be intelligent. I want to know the Word of God. I want to do the Word of God. And if I'm not doing it the way that the Word implies it, I need to change some things. Are we ready? Look to the person to your right and tell them, I'm ready. Look to the person on your left and tell them, we'll act like it. <laughs> Lift your hands with me. Father, today, we declare your word in this place. 
We've come in here to worship you. Holy Spirit, we have felt you moving in and out of these pews and up and down these aisles. Thank you for meeting with us. And we ask you, Lord, to abide with us. Open up our minds, our hearts, our eyes, our ears to your word. Make it make sense that we might apply it today. Make us more like you, Lord, we ask in every way. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Tell four people before you sit down, hey, just do it. Thank you, Corey. Great job today. Just do it. What I should do is take the A out of there and say faith, just do it. Faith, just do it. Faith is the key doctrine to the life of a Christian. You cannot be a Christian and not have faith. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, the, the sinner is saved through faith. We're not saved through works. We're saved through faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, the believer must walk by faith. I'm saved by faith. I must also walk by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Would you, would you agree with me and say faith is a big deal? For, for us as believers, faith is a big deal. It is the key doctrine to our walk and to our life. We can't be believers without faith. So here's what I want to do. I want to expand James chapter 2 about faith, and I want to tell you what James says faith is not. To understand faith, we first have to understand what it is not. Faith is not intellectual assent. There's an old saying that says knowledge is power, but knowledge will never be faith. You can read every book you want to on God, but you can still be a person without faith. You can understand Hebrew, Greek, and all. You can, you can go back and read all the, all the old scrolls, the hidden scrolls they found, the Dead Sea scrolls. You can read it all and still fail with faith. So knowledge is not about faith. Dead people substitute words for deeds, but their walk doesn't match their talk. You can talk all you want to about what kind of believer you are. All we want to do as a church is we want to, we want to just watch your works. One person asked me leaving the first service, well, well so, it's, so it's about works. It's not about works. It's about faith. But if I have faith, the work is a byproduct of my faith. If there's no byproduct, is there really faith? Mm. The response was dead and empty words. And James was saying, you're doing a lot of this and not a lot of this. You're doing a lot of talking and you're not doing a lot of walking. So James calls him out. In, in the Hebrew, the standard fail, farewell for Hebrews was this. Go, I wish you well. If, you, if they were departing company and somebody needed something, go, I wish you well. What we do today is we say stuff like, take care, see you later. I'll pray, I'll pray for you. That's the worst thing you could say to somebody, I'll pray for you. Because most of the time we say it and we never do it. It's all this. I want to challenge you, and I've challenged this church a couple years ago, and I want to do it again. Anytime somebody says, hey, could you pray for this? Yeah, I'll pray for you. Don't say that. You say, let's pray right now. One of the, one of the best things, I, I, I was in a motorcycle shop one time, and a lady was talking to me, and she got teary-eyed, and I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, just my daughter, my daughter. And I, I said, well, tell me about your daughter. And, and then she just said my, she was sick, she was uh, cancer, all this stuff. And, and I said, can I pray for your daughter? She said, please, would you pray? And I said, let's pray right now. And she goes, right here? <laughs> yes, right here. In the supermarket, somebody stopped me and said, hey, would you pray for, let's pray right now. You, you want to drop somebody's jaw? If somebody asks for prayer, drop that gauntlet right there. Why would you do that, pastor? Because I'm a man of my word. 
Here, here's, what I, here's what I've learned. If I tell you I'll pray for you and I walk away, I might forget. God forbid I was just saying to get away from you. Because we do that. I'll get out of here. It's getting too deep. I'll, I'll pray for you, brother. And you run away and you never pray. The best thing you can do as a believer, let's pray right now. What's their name? What's the situation? You don't have to be a theologian to pray for somebody. You just got to have the want to. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Intellectual, intellectual, intellectual. We use passive verbs, putting the responsibility on somebody else. God bless you. Take care. And we leave the situation where we could have helped the situation. And let me, let me just put this to rest. Not everybody's gunning for your wallet. Not everybody's gunning for your bank account. Not everybody wants a handout of money. They just want somebody who cares. Would you just pray for me? Could you just give me some advice? Could you just spend some time with me? This is what I've learned about, about death. When, when there's death in a family, and this goes to everybody, I learned that there is this ministry of presence. You don't bring presents like Christmas presents. Your presence is you. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. Just sit in a room. I don't know. All I know, in my time of need, I, I don't know what they said, but they were there. I just remember they, they were present in the room. That's works. I love you, man. I'm here for you. I don't know what to do. Someone sit over here, but I'm here if you need anything. Every once in a while, I'm not going to say this to spook anybody, but these woods will send people out of it. And guess where they come? They come here. So one particular day, I was in the parking lot, and uh, I, I thought I saw it, wasn't sure if I saw it, but my peripheral caught a, a person walking from the woods over here to the side of the church. I was like, eh, I'm seeing things. And my son said, Dad, there's a man that just walked around the side of the church. So I walk over there. And there's a man crouched down behind the HVAC systems over here. And I said, hey, man, what's going on? He goes, nothing. I said, I said can you come out here and talk to me? He goes, well, I'm busy doing something. And at that point, I'm like, mm-hmm. I said, I want you to stop what you're doing and come out here and talk to me. And he comes out with a cell phone in his hand and a power plug. And I said, what are you doing back there? He goes, I'm charging my phone. And I said, well, how'd you get here? He said, well, I'm passing through. I'm on my way to Richmond, but I've been staying in these woods for a couple days. And my phone was dead and I wanted to charge it. And so right away, I mean, I don't know the guy, but I'm learning. I'm, you know, you, you, when you talk to somebody for the first time, you, you try to find the pulse of the conversation. Is this person trustworthy? Are they dangerous? And so I'm talking to him and I got my feathers ruffled when he didn't respond to me the first time. Can I get a witness for that? Anybody, got, anybody get like that? I expect my kids to have first time obedience. I see someone crouching down beside our air conditioning. Hey, would you come on out here? Now, you know. Um, and so we're talking. He, he's a nice guy. Doesn't have a lot going on. And, and, I, and I said, uh, you're just trying to, trying to charge your phone? He's like, yeah. I said, are you hungry? He said, what? I said, are you hungry? When's the last time you had something to eat? He goes, it's been a while. I said, you want something to eat? He goes, you gonna get me something? I said, yeah, man. I said, I'll charge your phone too. I said, come inside here. He goes, well, wait, he goes, but my dog is over here in the woods. I got him tied up. I said, well, go get your dog. And I said, I'll get some things. Is your dog hungry? He goes, yeah. I said, well, get your dog and meet me over back over here. So he ties his dog to this tree out here. And I, I talked to Jared and Mike. I said, let's get this guy, let's get some, whatever we got in the kitchen, find something for this guy to eat. We had a bunch of potato chips and stuff and we got water and some things. And we watered his dog and fed his dog. And we just sit and talk to the guy. All he wanted to do was charge his phone. You know how easy it would be for me to just get out of here? <laughs> but when I saw him, I'm like, this, this is faith in action. What can I do to help you? He goes, I'm just trying to get to Richmond. Our job is, well, let's try to help you get to Richmond. And that's what we did. But then I had, a, not every situation is like that. One guy came out of the woods and he and I got squared up on the front porch out here, but that was a different story. But 
I think he, he had some things going on. But you can't say something as a believer and not do it. You can't say I'm a believer and not walk like a believer. You can't pass the buck to somebody else because you don't want to answer the call. Let me get, let me, is everybody okay with Pastor Jason? I know I probably lost about six viewers at home. Action, action is the fruit of faith living. Action is the fruit. We judge each other by our fruit, okay? In the early church, in the, in the book of Acts, some great things were going on, and the church was growing very quickly. But I want to show you what made the church grow. The church grew from salvations. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to everyone as he had need. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice that. The inventory of the kingdom is not how much money we have. The inventory of the kingdom is not how, much, how big our buildings are. The inventory of the kingdom is how many souls are being won to the kingdom. How many salvations are there? So here's the deal. Us as believers, we come in here to sharpen our tools. We sharpen our tools on Sunday, and we go out, and we're trying to be witnesses for Jesus Christ all week long. The tools are getting dull. we got to come back in and sharpen them. If you don't sharpen your tools, your work will be labor-intensive. Sharp tools, easy labor. Dull tools, hard labor. I had a friend of mine that had a garden, and he had a, he had a hoe that he was sharpening one day. I said, what are you, are you sharpening a hoe? He goes, yeah, man. He goes, when this thing's sharp, it goes through the dirt quick, and it makes it easier on me. He said, if that thing's dull, he goes, I'm just, I'm just beating the ground. And it hit me, sharp tools, easy labor. Tools equal labor. You're going to have labor no matter what. But the sharper you are, the easier you go into the, into the, in the soil. We come in on Sunday to sharpen our tools. Most of us miss Sundays and we wonder why things are so difficult because we've got dull tools. We're still believers, but the work is heavier. We sharpen our tools to go out and be witnesses for Jesus Christ like all believers should be. And what should be happening here at Valley Church is we should be adding souls to the kingdom weekly, if not daily. In 1 John chapter 3, Verse 17 and 18, it says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Woo. It's one thing to say I love you. It's a whole other thing to show you that I love you. And that's what... James is asking us to do. He said, just don't be a talker of the word, be a doer of the word. There's a story told, a parable that Jesus told of, of a man who was going from one point, one town to another town. And while he was going, he fell upon thieves and robbers. And they, they grabbed him, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, they took everything he had, and they left him bleeding in the ditch. And the Bible says, based upon the story of Jesus, that a priest came by and saw the man and walked on past him. A Levite also came, saw the man, walked past him. But then a Samaritan came by, saw the man, took pity on the man, dressed his wounds, helped him up, took him to a local inn, put him up in a room, told the innkeeper, I can't stay, I've got business in this other town, but if, if he needs anything, put it on my account. I'll take care of it when I get back. And Jesus tells this story, and he says, and he, the good person, was a Samaritan. It wasn't a big deal until Jesus said it was a Samaritan. If you know anything about Samaritans, the, word, the, the place, the town of Samaria was a difficult place to live. It, when, when the Babylonians took, took captive people, they took all their captive, and they kind of put them in this place of Samaria. 
and they begin to mingle. How many know if you get groups of people, put them together, they're going to, boys and girls will find each other. They started intermarrying. They, 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 the, the different nationalities, the different speaking, the different religious beliefs all begin to mingle together. And so the Jews looked at Samaritans as half-breeds. They're not good people. And Jesus had to go on a trip one time, and the disciple says, hey, let's go around Samaria. We don't want to go to Samaria. And Jesus says, I must need go through Samaria. There, there's an appointment there for me you guys don't know about. And when Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan, it's, it's weird because if any of the people should be good, it's not that Samaritan, but Jesus said it was the Samaritan that did good. But what, what was good about it? He did what was right. He saw a person in need and he helped. Huh. The priest and the Levite were good people. And they were going to do good things. When you hear their excuses, they were going to do good things, but they were passing up a need that was right in front of their face. The Samaritan, he had a schedule too. That's why, that's why he left the innkeeper with, with a, a charge. Whatever happens when I'm not here, take care of it. I'll pay you when I come back. Pretty important. I see dead people. Dead people who have an intellectual experience, but whose faith is dead by their deeds. What faith is not? It's not intellectual assent, and it's not emotional response. Here at Valley Church, we've been accused of being emotional because we get excited. We like worship. We like it hot. We like it fast. We like it deep. We like it slow. We like worship. We like our fellowship. And sometimes we got to hit the lights a couple times and say, disperse, go home. Because we love our fellowship. Emotion doesn't equal faith. Let me show you something. The Bible says even the demons believe and shudder of who Jesus is. Even the demons believe and shudder. A belief in or fear of God does not constitute a faith in God. Feeling guilty or convicted doesn't show you faith in God. Satan and his demons know who God is. Satan and his demons know what Jesus did on the cross. Satan and his demons know what their future holds. They know these things. That's why they shudder. It is an emotional response well, let, me, let me show you this. In, in, in Luke chapter 8, there's a st the story goes where Jesus and his disciples were in a boat. They went across this, the lake, and they, they stopped at this other place, and they get out of the boat. And when, when they get out of the boat, they notice something bizarre, that there's a naked man running through the tombstones. He's breaking off the tombstones, and he's taking the stones, and he's cutting his flesh with the stones. There are chains hanging from the man's wrist and from his ankles. Every man in the town is afraid of this man. Jesus confronts the man, and he realizes immediately that something's wrong with this man, and Jesus realizes he's possessed by demons. So Jesus has a conversation with the demons. If you ever are confronted with a demonic person, you're not talking to the person. See, it's messing the babies up in here. I'm talking about demons. Sorry, moms. It, she said, preach it. That's what she said. Notice what Jesus does in the encounter. Jesus looks at the man, but he speaks to the demon. He said, who am I speaking to? And the demon says, we are legion because we are many. And Jesus went right at it. But I want to show you in the word of God, the conversation between Jesus and the demons. In, in Luke chapter 8, verse 28, it says this. When he saw Jesus, the demon, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me? Look at this. Jesus, son of the most high. 
there's, an, there, there's, there's enough intellect here that he knows who Jesus is, son of the most high. And here comes the emotion. I beg you, don't torture me. You see intellect and you see emotion all wrapped in this. The demons didn't have faith in Jesus, but they knew who Jesus was. They knew his power. Mm. We have this intellect and this emotion also. We know about Jesus and we get emotional about what he can do to us or for us. But that is not faith. I want to tell everybody in this house, God is merciful. God is merciful. And if you ask him for mercy, you're going to get mercy. It's pride he cannot stand. He loves a humble heart. Look, look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, I don't, it doesn't say if somebody else says, confesses my sins for me. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If I ask for the forgiveness of my sin, if I acknowledge that I have sinned and I say, Lord, forgive me, I have not done well, I've, I've done wrong, and I need you to forgive me. The Bible says he is faithful, he is just, he shows mercy, he's going to forgive me, and he's going to, he's going to take away all of my unrighteousness if I ask him. What is faith? We talked about what faith is not. What is faith? Faith is, real faith involves the mind, the emotions, and the will. We receive the knowledge of God's word, and we act according to that by being obedient. Years ago, there was a commercial about this little old lady that was trying to find the beef on this hamburger bun. And remember, she, she'd always say, where's the beef? Where's the beef? You, may get, you guys may be too young for that, but I remember that. And, and you, you'd have these commercials where you had these big hamburger buns and that little patty. And she, she was like, where's the beef? And she had an attitude about it too. It was kind of funny. I do believe that there are times God says the same thing to us, but he doesn't say beef. He says faith. Where's the faith? You got all these, you got these, this bun, this lettuce, this tomato, these pickles. You got everything else here, but, but where's the faith that's supposed to make up the burger? We have all these accessories, but the one thing he's looking for is the faith. Interesting, Pastor Jason. Warren uh, Worsby said this. He said, no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come into contact with 220-volt wire and remain the same. When I was a kid, our parents tortured us. There was expectation of things that I didn't think today you wouldn't get by with those today. But, but we used to have this thing called a yard right outside our house, grass grew in it. And they expected us to mow that thing. I'm nine years old, expected to push mow this, what I thought was 28 acres. And so I would mow the grass. And we had those old, you didn't, back then you didn't have those release buttons that turns the blade off or cuts the mower off. When you started that thing, there was a motor and a blade on wheels and it, it ran until you cut it off. In ours, you had to pull it about 10 or 12 times to get it started. There was no priming button. It just, I remember I'd, I'd cut the grass one day and, and some guys were there. My stepfather was there and some other guys from the church. And I'm a nine-year-old kid. I'm sweating. I'm mowing the grass and I stop and we're talking and, and the motor's running on this lawnmower. And we're just talking and I'm, I'm a curious kid. I want to know how things work. I want to know how they operate. And, and there was a button on that mower and I just asked the question, what does that button do? And my stepfather says, well, I don't know, touch it, push, push that button. 
So I pushed that button. I don't know if you guys know, this was before breakdancing came in, but I did the first pop lock. It was, it was the spark plug. I touched that spark plug, energy went through this arm. It was, it was, it was, one, of the, it was one of those right there. Just, oh my God. But it went through my arm, up my arm, across my chest, out the other side. And I pulled, I pulled, I, I couldn't get off of it at first and I pulled back. I was like, oh my God. And all the men are laughing at me, this little nine-year-old boy. And I'm like, why would you do that? Tear coming out of my eye. <laughs> I've never forgot that story. The pain and the jolt from that spark plug. I'm telling you, it lit me up, man. And, I, and I'm not kidding. And I'm, I'm talking, it, it, it went through this arm. And it was, it was like, boom, boom. If I was touching anybody, they'd have been, they'd have been lit up. And then he says this, he says, no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come in contact with 220 wire and remain the same. I've never touched 220 wire this live, but I touched a spark plug on a lawnmower and I've never forgot it. I, I've had an encounter with Jesus Christ and I've never forgot it. I've not been the same since the encounter. That spark plug doesn't, doesn't, doesn't compare to what I experienced with Jesus Christ on the first time. So I want to tell you that, that if you've had a true experience with Jesus Christ, there, there should be evidence of the experience. There should be something that separates you. I, I didn't leave the lawnmower spark plug. It, it scarred me. I've never, well, when I was in high school, I, I, I was part of the caretaking group for the campground, and we had to mow and weed eat all this whole campground, and we had an old home light lawnmower, I mean, not only like weed eater, and I had, to, I had to hit all these hills, and it wasn't bad, but when it would rain, we still weed eat it in the rain. And that old home light had a spark plug that didn't have a cover on it, and when it would rain, and my elbow would hit that spark plug, and I would try to straighten my arms out like this, but you know, you get that... It was the same experience going back to that. It, it lit me up one time over here on top of the hill, and I, I threw it down into the street. And I just walked up to the shed. I said, I'm done. When you have an experience that you cannot deny, it'll change you. Works are a byproduct of our faith. Works are not our faith. Works do not save us. Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ save us. But once we're saved, we start this walk with him. And in this walk, we start looking like him, talking like him, acting like him. We become his hands and feet on this earth. And sometimes we do things that aren't very pleasant, but they need to be done. Sometimes we help people that only a mother could love, but we're there to help them. And you can't, you can't dictate what responsibilities you're going to have until you're in front of it. I, I took that, when that man walked out of the woods that day and had his dog, I took it as a test. God, you're testing me because I want to send this man packing, sneaking over here, plugging into our power supply. How dare he? But humility came over me and said, God said, help him. What can I do for you? Well, I, he didn't ask for anything. I just opened up the cabinets. And I said, Lord, if you're testing me, I'm passing this test. If this is a test, I want Jared and Mike to pass it too. So I brought them into the equation. Treat every situation like it's a test. Lord, can I pass this test? And let me tell you, there are people out there that, that are not in need, that are there to take advantage of you. One time over here at Valley View, I was sitting at Chick-fil-A and I was watching this guy hold a cardboard sign up on the corner by the stoplights. And I wanted to help the guy. So I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm watching him. And I notice after about 15 minutes, he folds up his sign. He goes into the parking lot over here behind, over by Sears. And he gets into a car that's nicer than my car. And I don't have a nice car, but it was, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Two other people get out of his car, grab his sign and come over and they sit while he sits in the air conditioning car. 
And I said, wait a minute. I want to help this guy, but now I don't know if I want to help him. And I want to tell you, not everybody's in need. And you got to pray, Lord, give me discernment. What do I do here? How much do I do here? I want to be as wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. But Lord, I need your eyes. I need your conviction. I, I need your spirit to lead me here. I don't know what to do. And this is a deal. Even if you make a mistake, you do it for his glory. Lord, I helped that person. I don't think they really needed help after I'm finished, but Lord, to you be the glory. Because God's the righteous judge. He knows our hearts. There's going to be a time when we're all standing before the throne and the Bible says there's going to be some that say, Lord, we did this and that and this in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I, I don't know you. But we did this in your name. But I don't know you. You might know of me, but we don't have a relationship. The number one thing in this whole thing of faith is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That he knows me by name and I know him intimately. And when he looks at me, I just want him to say, Jason, I know it was tough down there for you. I put you in some tough spots, but well done. You didn't always make the right decision, but boy, your heart was right. Well done, good and faithful servant. I never want to hear those words, I don't know you. But Lord, I pastored Valley Church, and Lord, we won these people to your kingdom, we did it. But I don't know you. I don't know where you are today, but I pray you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to close right here. Faith, faith must be demonstrated by actions and deeds. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the first part of verse 5, he says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Men, women, you can't relate to this. You guys are a much delicate and much more intelligent species than men. But when we have things happen in our bodies, we don't tell nobody. You get a pain somewhere, you don't say nothing. You have, it's, yeah, that'll pass. We give it about a week. And after a week, it's still there. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to tell my wife because she's going to make me want to go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor. And we always do self-evaluations. I've got this thing going off my wrist. And I'm just like, oh, that hurts so bad. But I am not telling Susie because I know what she's going to say. And ladies, we get mad at you we get short with you because you say the truth and we don't want to hear the truth. And you say what we're thinking, but we don't want to hear it. And we get frustrated because you're saying truth. And then you get confused. I just said the obvious. But we don't want to go to the doctor until it gets so bad that it's like, I need to go. I, need, see, I, I told you this, listen, I've got something going on with my wrist. It's coming down through my hand, up through my arm. I don't know what it is. So I go to the doctor. I finally, I finally tell, I've been dealing with it for months. I finally tell her, I said, I don't know what's going on, man. And the doctor takes an x-ray of it and she says, you know, you broke your wrist twice. <laughs> I'm just like, what? She said, you've got scar tissue all down through it. She goes, and you have arthritis that is all over your wrist. She goes, I'm going to recommend you to an orthopedic. I'm like, okay. So she gives me the number of the orthopedic. That was about two months ago. And this weekend I said, Susie, I need to call the orthopedic. My, I can't take it anymore. She goes, well, how long you had that number? I've had about two months. Oh my gosh, Jason. My pastor told me that sometimes the voice of God sounds a lot like your wife's because she's speaking truth. So what I want to tell you is this. Sometimes we got to look at ourselves as believers we gotta do a self-examination. What are my motives? Am I helping anyone? And I told you, help is not always the wallet. 
Sometimes it's a conversation. Sometimes it's spending time with somebody. Sometimes it's just giving somebody a minute. If you ever think about somebody and they come to your mind and you can't shake them, let me tell you what to do with that. Call them. If you don't want to get in a long conversation, text them. Hey, I'm thinking about you, man. How's everything going? What I've found in my life when that happens to me and I make that phone call, I called at the right time. Pastor, you don't know. I've been dealing. I said, I didn't know. But I just felt I needed to call you. You know what's going on in that moment? The Holy Spirit's working for you. The Holy Spirit's trying to motivate you to be the hands and feet of Christ. You don't have to have the right answer. You don't have to have an answer, period. I just, I just wanted to call you. I, I was thinking about you. Is everything okay? Can I do anything for you? You know, when you say that, this is what I found. Anytime I say, hey, what can I do for you? Most people say, nothing, just pray. <laughs> Let's pray right now. Right now. Let's stand together. Faith. Just do it. <laughs> Faith. Just do it. Faith. Just do it. When you get to the point in your walk with Christ where you don't have to think about it, you're just obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's when it's good. That's when you're hitting on all cylinders. You know, I don't run around looking for opportunities to help people. Because sometimes I'm trying to stay between the two, two lines. But there are times something just comes in front of you and you gotta deal with it. Like, what do I do here, Lord? How do I handle this? Holy Spirit, give me wisdom. I don't know what to say here. Lord, lead and guide my thoughts and my words. Let me know when to shut up. Let me know when to speak. Let me know when to stay. Let me know when to leave. What is too much? What is not enough? We are to be led by the Holy Spirit as believers. Jesus told his disciples when they go into a place, he says, don't even take a thought of what you should say. Let the Spirit lead you. And when you get to that point in your walk, when you're asking, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. I don't know what to do right here. That's when, you're, that's when you're cooking with gas. That's when things are getting hot. I want to close with this, Mike, if you'll come. In James chapter 2, this is where we started. After everything I said, I want you to hear it one more time. Okay? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you say to him, go in peace, be, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, it is dead. What I want to do is start a revival of people that love people. You know, people talk about revival all the time and they, they think revivals are these big, great church services. That's not revival. Revival is when we leave the church and someone has plugged us into a source. Then it's like we're at the church already, but I'm sitting at work. I'm just sitting in traffic. I, you know, I'm, I'm walking through Walmart and I see something. Let me, let me, let me pray with you. I dare. Nay, I double dog dare somebody in this house to take this challenge. This week, somewhere, somehow, somebody's going to bring something to your attention. And I want you to, want you to tell them, I'm going to pray about that. And when they say, would you please, I want you to say this, let's pray right now. You don't have to have an elegant prayer. But you say, Lord, you know their need. Answer their request. You're going to see them look at you. You're probably going to see a tear come out of their eye. And it's going to change the way they look at you. Because you just, you are the conduit of Jesus Christ. And they're going to look at you, oh, could you also pray for this? And yes, I can. That is when you walk in revival. So I want to encourage you, be the head and not the tail. Be blessed coming in and going out. Be blessed in the city and be in the field. Be a person of hope. Back in the day, we used to say, up with hope, down with dope. 
Hey, up with hope. Take the challenge. I double dog dare somebody in there to pray with someone this week, wherever they ask for. Pass the test. Pastor Mike. Amen. Faith without works is dead. And so with that, we're closing up our series, I Serve. And, uh, and so if you have not served or, or signed up for a ministry, we are highlighting uh, a couple of ministries uh, this week, and uh, you can sign up in the cafe. Uh, first will be the men's ministry. That's uh, uh, Garth Landis leads that. Um, and just, I'm going to read you some descriptions. So with the men's ministry, all men, it's time to step up and be a man. Uh, so get, get over there and check out the men's ministry. Again, see Garth. He's a fantastic men's uh, ministry leader. Um, next steps, if you are part of a, a cookie ministry, our cookie crew, um, if you're a first-time guest, uh, you, you, you're going to get some cookies. And so if you would like to sign up to participate, either deliver cookies or potentially make some cookies, um, sign up with Jimmy and Karen Harrelson. Uh, how many of you guys know that when we uh, you know, meet, we uh, eat, right? So some church folk know how to eat. And so Debbie Davis... Uh, she's in charge of our hospitality ministry. Uh, so anytime, uh, anytime, again, anytime we're meeting, we're eating. So see Debbie uh, if you want to help out there. More hands make the work light. Uh, and then we have our maintenance team. Uh, Adam Ayers is over that. Uh, so that's anything inside and outside of the building. We have a team that volunteers every Thursday morning to clean our church. Um, and they are faithful. They've been faithful for years. So if you're interested in potentially helping out with that team, sign up over there on the maintenance side also. Uh, Reach, how many of you guys are involved in Reach? Nice, all right. So that's one of our largest ministries. We've got over 200 volunteers. They need more. Uh, if you're interested in, in, uh, in reaching out to our community, we do about two to three times events a week. I'm sorry, not a week, um, a month. Uh, Melody Underwood's over there. Uh, and over that ministry, she's doing a fantastic job. And then we have the media ministry. This is where I'm going to take a little bit of time. Uh, this is my ministry that I'm over. So uh, if you are interested in serving, uh, you know, with a video camera and or uh, our pro presenter, anything in the back booth, uh, anything that, if, if you see us on Facebook or social media or YouTube, anything like that, that's, that's the media ministry. Get involved. You know, we are impacting the world on a whole nother level, uh, and it's different. We partner with worship uh, and Corey. Uh, so if you're interested in running sound, uh, any lighting, anything like that, if you have experience or even if you don't have experience, check out that ministry. We'd love to be able to train you, and, uh, and especially if we go to three services, not if, when we go to three services. Uh, and then finally, um, before we say our benediction, just two topics. One, we've got the block party. This is an, uh, an opportunity for you to bring your friends, your family, just to hang out. Uh, there's going to be live music. There's going to be food. Uh, food trucks are going to be available for you to purchase it. We've got uh, inflatable. We've got games, things like that. Get involved. It is going to be a fantastic time next week right after service. And then we've got our summit. So our summit is our leadership. We do it four times a year. Um, that you know, pastor comes in, he, he, he speaks to us, he pours over us, and then you get to uh, meet with the ministries that you're involved in. We provide food, so uh, be sure to check us out tonight. Um, and with that being said, if you are involved in that or if you want to be involved, can you stay back and help just uh, set the sanctuary up so we can serve you? Um, that is it. And so if you guys can share with me in the benediction, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.